coming up in this edition of the 2018 FIFA World Cup magazine, we're in Sochi. We learn how Russia 2018 is inspiring some local artists. And we meet national team forward Fedor Smolov. The heart of the Russian Riviera, on the shores of the Black Sea, Sochi is famed for its warm climate. A popular tourist destination, the city has developed a reputation as the place for rest and recuperation in Russia and annually attracts two million visitors, almost five times its own population. The combination of mountains and sea is a unique phenomenon. There are very few cities in the world that can offer this diversity. Sochi's climate is subtropical. But despite this, you can enjoy some fantastic skiing up in the mountains, while also enjoying the sea. The city's main mountain resort is Rosa Kuta. 45 minutes from Sochi, it was one of the venues used at the 2014 Winter Olympics and offers a variety of outdoor pursuits. These days, Rosa Kuta is a year-round resort. In winter, our guests have access to a wide variety of ski runs. We have more than 77 kilometers of slopes that they can choose from. The slopes vary in difficulty. There are simple ones for beginners, right through to the runs that were used in the Olympics. In summer, of course, the resort has a different look to it. Visitors can access a number of mountain bike trails, go horse riding, or just explore the mountains by hiking the tourist tracks. Aside from these activities, Sochi is also well known for the number of spas that dot the surrounding landscape. In Rosa Kuta, the most common type of spa is the traditional Russian banya. People who visit Sochi call it a mecca for banyas. It's a very popular place for visitors to try a banya. I think this is partly to do with being up in the mountains. The landscape and the setting is conducive to wanting to feel fit and healthy. People come to a banya to help their bodies self-heal and to relax. A banya starts with the procedure of herbal steaming. It's very gentle and encourages a person to relax as they breathe in the herbal aroma. After this, they move to another steam room called a parilka. In this room, two or three attendants continue the banya process. The perilka is where the body is warmed up. Twigs are used to help stimulate the guest's blood circulation and accelerate the opening of the pores. Following this, the guest jumps into a pool of cold water. This is to contrast the heat of the steam room and is a pleasant experience. After this, they can sit and relax in the outdoor pool. And if they wish, they can have a final treatment such as a massage or wrapping. The Russian people like to relax and take care of themselves. Banyas are an integral part of our culture. With Sochi set to host six games during the 2018 FIFA World Cup, there'll be plenty of opportunities for fans to relax and soak up all that the city has to offer. The many visitors we have here each year always say how beautiful it is. I would like to take this opportunity to invite everyone who hasn't been here before to come and experience it for themselves. Located 30 kilometers from downtown Sochi in Adler lies the Fischt Stadium. Originally built for the 2014 Winter Olympics, the arena is currently undergoing a facelift that will alter its overall appearance. The roof has been removed to open up both ends of the stadium, offering fans views of the sea to the south and the mountains to the north. 
Meanwhile, stands are being built at either end of the pitch, increasing capacity to over 47,000. Every stadium being built in Russia for the World Cup has its own unique design, its own stamp that reflects the region. Our stadium's appearance is based on the shape of the crest of Mount Fisht. In the local Adygean language, Fisht means whitehead, and for this reason the stadium is painted white. Aside from the changes we've made to the stadium's overall appearance, the biggest change from 2014 is the installation of the pitch. It's a natural grass pitch, not an artificial one. Due for completion in 2016, the stadium is one of four venues for the 2017 FIFA Confederations Cup. It will host a total of four matches, including one semi-final, before staging four games at the 2018 FIFA World Cup, including a round of 16 match and a quarter-final. Our stadium will have a great atmosphere, one worthy of this celebration of football. People who've never been to a game before will be amazed. You don't have to be a fan to recognize that this is a massive event in our history. Sochi is the Olympic capital of Russia. In 2014, we hosted two truly world-class events, the Olympic and Paralympic Games. They helped shape the city to what it is today. Now we're hosting the FIFA World Cup. Not only can we showcase again that we can hold an outstanding event like this, but we want to take it to the next level. It's very important for us to host a Football World Cup because we want to show everyone that not only can we host a winter sports event, but also a major summer one too. Football in Sochi may lack the history and glamour of some of the other host cities, but the hope is that the 2018 tournament can kick-start a football revolution here with the stadium serving as an inspiration for the next generation of players. The legacy of any major sporting event is important. We hope that the World Cup will increase the numbers of people participating in football. For us, it's about the development of the game from the grassroots, with children right through to the professional level. This is an opportunity for us to build this broad base. We're proud that the World Cup is coming to Sochi, and we want to make sure it leaves a lasting legacy on the game here. The 2018 will mark the 21st edition of the FIFA World Cup. Here to share his memories of the 1958 tournament is a legend of the Russian game. The World Cup is the pinnacle of football. It features the best players in the world, showcasing their skills. It's every player's dream to play at the tournament. During the 1950s, Nikita Simonyan was a key member of the Soviet Union's national team. And along with his teammates, the forward travelled to the 1958 FIFA World Cup with high expectations. This was the first time the USSR had competed at the finals and the team headed to Sweden as the reigning Olympic champions. <laughs> In one word, the team spirit was healthy. There was a good atmosphere amongst the squad. Even though we had players from Dynamo, Spartak and Torpedo, there were no problems. We were the national team and we were one unit. Everyone forgot which club they played for and where they came from. There was only one objective, unity. And of course, achieving the highest goal. Drawn in a group with Brazil, Austria and England, who they faced in their opening game, the USSR were led out by Simonian as regular captain Igor Neto had suffered an injury. A captain, like a coach, is responsible for the result. It's your responsibility to galvanize the team, offer the players support and motivate them throughout the match. There's a saying, you're not a soldier if you don't want to be a general. And you are neither a soldier nor a general if you go into battle without the confidence or the will to win the fight. 
Along with captaining his country on their World Cup debut, Simonian made history when he scored the Soviet Union's first ever goal at a FIFA World Cup. The goal was the result of the team's effort. It was a team goal. Of course, it's always nice when you just score it yourself without any assistance. But that wasn't the case. I scored because my teammates created the opportunity for me. The goal was as much about them as it was about me scoring it. Despite taking a 2-0 lead, the match against England ended in a draw. In their second match against Austria, the USSR recorded their first World Cup victory before facing Brazil in their final group game. Played in front of a crowd of 50,000 at the Ulevi Stadium in Gothenburg, the match featured a then-unknown 17-year-old Brazilian who would go on to rewrite the record books. Playing Brazil was unbelievable. As history shows, it was the first time Pele played at the World Cup, and it was against us. I think he's the best player in the history of the tournament, but back then, he was just beginning. They arrived with a new formation, which was 4-2-4. They closed off the central zone of defence, which stifled any attack, and used two wide players on the flanks. Players like Gahincha, who performed miracles in that match. And as I've already mentioned, there was Pele. I remember speaking to Sergei Salnikov, who was a former player, after the game. He came up to me in the changing room and said, you know, old man, although we lost, that match still made me happy. It was fantastic to watch such great football being played by Brazil. Though the USSR progressed to the quarterfinals via a playoff victory over England, it would be as far as they went as host Sweden ended their World Cup ambitions. It's difficult to say whether we should have won it or not. That Swedish team was very good. They were the hosts, they had the crowd on their side, and they played good football. What can I say? That's football. The tournament may have ended sooner than he would have liked, but even now, over half a century later, it still holds a special place in Nikita Simonian's heart. Playing at the 1958 World Cup in Sweden has stayed with me my whole life. No one can take the fact that I played at the finals away from me. It was an honour and an unbelievable experience that's left me with some incredible memories. Eleven of Russia's cities will host the 2018 tournament. Here to tell us about his hometown is a champion weightlifter. Hi, I'm Vladislav Yarkin. I am a four-time Russian weightlifting champion, a junior European Championship gold medalist, and a bronze medal winner at the Junior World Championships. I'd like to invite you to my home city of Sochi. It's a wonderful place which has a number of interesting sites worth visiting. One of the first places visitors to our city should see is Novodinskaya. The street is in the center of the city. It's lined by palm trees and flowers. It's a very beautiful location. It's a popular place for families, especially ones with small children. It's just a nice place to go for a walk. The Museum of Sports Glory is another interesting place to visit. It is located next to the central square, just off Novodinskaya. It tells the story of all the well-known Olympic champions and sports people of our city. I am personally proud of the fact that after coaching my younger brother to a silver medal at the 2014 Youth Olympics in China, we presented it to the city's mayor, who placed it in in the museum, where there is an entire exhibit devoted to this achievement. 
Но также Another place I'd like to single out is the Black Sea shoreline and the seaport. It's a vibrant part of the city and a great place to relax. I think it's places like this and the city's geographical location that makes Sochi unique. You can travel from one climate to another in 30 minutes. You can be standing at the top of a snowy mountain one minute and then be experiencing tropical sunshine down by the sea another. I hope you enjoyed my brief tour of Sochi. I look forward to seeing you in 2018. See you soon. Located in the Sum department store in downtown Sochi is an art exhibition called Football and Eternity. It's the latest work from award-winning husband and wife duo Vladimir and Victorio Kirilenko. Art is our life. Art is everything we do. Who we are is reflected in what we create, our sculptures and our paintings. Vladimir and I have been together for 29 years now. As long as we've been together, we have painted. Our exhibition, Football and Eternity, was inspired by the FIFA World Cup. We decided to put it together when Sochi was announced as one of the host cities for 2018. It motivated us a lot and gave birth to this wonderful football project. The exhibition is devoted entirely to football. It represents football as life in miniature, and the name itself, Football and Eternity, is not by chance. It comes from the saying, life is short and art is eternal. I think it sums up perfectly what this exhibition represents. Players were a great source of inspiration to us. Look at Messi, he's a football god. How can he not inspire you? We chose to paint a number of the players as Byzantium icons with golden balls behind their heads. This is because these are people who made a great contribution to the development of football. Players such as Pele and Yashin. Yashin especially is truly an icon of Russian football. Every Russian footballer, young or old, knows his name. The look of the exhibition overall speaks to the painter's world view, which for us is about the deep essence of things. To convey this message, we choose to look at life through the prism of grotesque. The fact is that modern man is not without self-irony. A man who doesn't understand humor is out of touch with the world. To date, the Kirilenko's Football and Eternity exhibition has toured a number of cities across Russia, showcasing their work to thousands. And the plan is to take it on the road again, ahead of the 2018 FIFA World Cup. We want our exhibition to attract lovers of both football and art. We think they can unite people and make them happy. Everything around us influences us as people in its own way, and art is no different. A viewer forms his own opinion of it and, of course, thinks about what the artist may be trying to say, but he interprets it how he sees it. We're looking forward to sharing our work with as many people as possible. I think from the moment I started watching football on TV, I understood that it was my calling. I remember once when I was watching a game, I asked my father who was playing. He said it was AC Milan. I liked the fact that George Ware was the only one wearing red boots. He became my favourite player and someone I wanted to emulate. 
Born and raised in Saratov, 250 kilometers north of Volgograd, Fedor Smolov is one of the current stars of Russian football. He began his career at the local academy, but his standout talent meant he soon attracted the attentions of clubs from the capital. In 2007, age 17, he joined Dynamo Moscow. I had a number of options when Dinamo approached me with an offer. My father was the one who convinced me to join them. He said they had a rich history and being a Moscow club meant it was a good place for me to develop my game. Smolov's time in Moscow did not go according to plan. He made only 68 appearances for Dinamo over the course of eight years, enduring a number of loan moves. He finally left Dinamo for good in the summer of 2015, signing for one of the rising powerhouses of the Russian game, FC Krasnodar. Nicknamed the Bulls, the club has challenged the establishment of Moscow and St. Petersburg over the last few seasons and regularly qualifies for Europe. This season, Smolov leads the team's goal-scoring charts and is currently the highest-scoring Russian in the Premier League. What attracted me was the atmosphere at the club, the attitude of everyone here. It's a club that has been developing rapidly and has very clear goals. Another plus for me was the climate in the Kra region. It's perfect for football all year round. Everyone here understands and believes in what the president of the club has set out to achieve. We are all united in achieving the highest results possible. Smolov has also made his mark at international level. Having represented his country at the 2011 Under-21 UEFA European Championship, he made his senior debut the following year. To date, he's made 12 appearances, and although he missed out on selection for the 2014 FIFA World Cup, the 26-year-old has firmly established himself under current national coach Leonid Slutsky. In Russia's last three internationals, he scored twice, helping the team qualify for Euro 2016. It's a great honour for me, and it's with great pride that I have been able to represent my country. We're the biggest country in the world, and our fans expect good results every time we play. It's a big responsibility to wear the shirt. The fact that we've qualified for the European Championship is very important. As a team, our aim is always to ensure we're part of these huge tournaments. And for me personally, I'm working hard to make sure I'm part of the squad that goes to France. At the tournament, I think our chances are very good. If you look objectively at the other teams in our group, England, Wales and Slovakia, I think we should be able to qualify for the knockout stages. Following the tournament in June, Fedor Smolov's next goal is the 2018 FIFA World Cup. The World Cup fills me with pride and joy. It's an event of world importance. The fact it's going to take place here in Russia makes me happy. As a player, it's hugely motivating. As a player to FIFA World Cup, especially one in your own country, doesn't happen for everyone. I'm very lucky that this opportunity has presented itself. To be part of the national team in 2018 would be a huge honour for me because it will be a historic moment in Russian football.